never had the opportunity to, to understand what her cells were going to be used for. She never had the opportunity to actually consent to that. Um, and many researchers made a lot of money um, off of this cell line. Um, and none of that money um, was ever um, shared with her family. Um, and her family still didn't understand um, the extent to which her cell line was being used. Um, so as a result of um, kind of studying this case, um, there has been um, informed consent for biospecimen research that has been added to a lot of um, clinical research trials. So um, if there is kind of a condition where there's a lot of um, need for medication, uh, need for continued research, um, it is often a separate consent um, that will allow for um, the de-identified storing of these um, biospecimen samples to be used potentially in further research. Um, what can be somewhat controversial about this is that many specimens can still be used without the patient's knowledge or consent. So it's pretty standard that a lot of times with um, any sort of um, a biopsy or treatment that sometimes those samples can then be taken for research. Um, and sometimes um, those can be banked in a de-identified way. Um, when they are banked in a de-identified way, um, they can often then be used for further research without um, kind of it being a threat to a subject's or a patient's identification. Um, and therefore, it's not always, um, the, the patient isn't always made aware of that. So there is continuing to be a lot of conversations among um, research ethicists about how we can be more transparent in the way that we're using specimens while continuing to do really vital research. Um, you know, there's been a lot of advancements made in, of course, the treatment of a variety of cancers, but also in the treatment of Alzheimer's, in the treatment of multiple sclerosis. And we certainly don't want to slow down or stop those research, or research but how can we be transparent, ensuring that patients understand um, how their information might be used in the future? Um, okay. So I wanted to give just kind of a sum up of modern clinical research. And I think it's also just um, to really see that, you know, this is over the last um, just about 60 years, just a little over 60 years. We've gone from the first randomized controlled trial to an international harmonization act of the way that we are going to collect research, the way we're going to analyze it, and the way that we're going to share that information with the public. Um, so it's pretty remarkable um, and also shows just, um, you know, the lessons that we continue to be learning, um, the, the lessons that we need to be continuing to learn, um, and, and really being held to those, that foundational ethics that guide the way that we do clinical research. Um, so I just thought this was really interesting as I put the timeline in. Um, so next I wanted to talk a little bit about how we regulate clinical research. Um, I focus primarily on the United States, um, but it's very similar in other countries. So um, the FDA um, is very, it is obviously a US governmental agency, um, but a lot of the regulations and the way that they regulate drugs because um, so many of the medications that are um, used around the world are manufactured by companies that are in the United States or um, want to be sold in the United States. A lot of um, FDA regulations end up going outside of the United States. Um, so the FDA is the oldest comprehensive consumer protection agency in the U.S. federal government. Um, one thing that I think is really important to call out is that it's a consumer protection agency. I think that um, sometimes this can get a little bit lost. Um, it is not just a government agency that um, is supposed to be um, helping drug companies or device companies. Um, it is really there for us as the consumer of those um, products. Um, so the FDA has its origins um, beginning in 1914, 90, 1948, sorry about that, 
um, with a chemical analysis to monitor the safety of agricultural products. Um, it was known then as the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Agriculture later became the FDA in 1930. So this really started, of course, you know, with um, in, in kind of the farming community, ensuring that um, food products were safe to ingest. Um, it became a modern regulatory body um, with the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906. Um, and what's interesting is that this became a necessity um, because there were a lot of people kind of making their own homemade concoctions and then selling them as a cure for um, whatever, um, maybe ailing people. Um, and this also ties into some of the ways that alcohol is produced. So um, there was un some unfortunate poisoning of people with alcohol that was um, not pure um, and ended up being very dangerous for some people. So there was a need for some way to have a regulatory body that was making sure that um, ingestible food, ingestible drugs um, was safe. So um, with the passage of the Pure Food and Drugs Act, um, it led to not only greater accountability for marketing of food, um, but also for the need of testing drugs in clinical trials. Um, and so thus we see um, more and more testing clinical trials showing data that, that this is actually safe on a large percentage of the population. Um, so as the FDA has changed um, through social and economic changes, um, it's also, its reach has, has grown. So it now just um, doesn't just regulate food and drugs or things that kind of go into our bodies, but it also um, regulates cosmetics. So things that are on your body, medical devices, which are things that could be um, used on your body or implanted in your body, um, and also veterinary medicine. So um, they are also ensuring safety of a lot of medications for um, our furry family members. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of um, regulations reach beyond the U.S. borders. So um, most medications, most devices, um, while they may be produced in another country um, or the initial testing may be done in another country, um, they will almost always um, end up applying for approval through the FDA um, because most companies have a desire to be able to market either those drugs or devices or food within the United States. So the next um, layer of regulation for clinical research are institutional review boards. Um, and these are an administrative body comprised of scientists and non-scientists that are established to protect the rights and welfare of human research subjects. Um, you will often see IRBs um, within large universities. Um, the University of Colorado has an IRB, it's called Comerb, um, and DU has, a, has an IRB, it's a little bit smaller, um, but any academic medical center um, will have some type of an IRB that is reviewing all clinical research that is gonna be done um, within their medical center. Um, so there are local IRBs, um, as, as I mentioned, like Comerb. Um, there are also national IRBs. So um, as there's so much research going on, there can be larger clinical trials um, that may be too large for a local IRB to review in a timely manner. As a result, there are national IRBs that can then um, you know, are located in different states than maybe where the research is gonna be conducted, um, but they will look at that research, they'll look at um, how it's going to impact the local population, and then they will um, approve that, those protocols. So um, for any research that is done at any hospital um, or um, any medical facility, um, all of those protocols have been reviewed um, the informed consent forms have been reviewed, um, and any material that's going to be presented to a potential subject has to be reviewed. So anytime we want to use a questionnaire with one of our protocols and the patient is actually going to see it, it has to be approved. 
Um, and so often, if you are participating in any research, um, you'll see at the, the top of one of the pages, often in the corner, um, you know, you'll see an IRB number and a day that it's approved. Um, so the reason that, that these bodies exist is to really ensure that um, this research is not just safe for a human, but there is also has, um, there's also a purpose to it, that it's not going to cause more harm than um, benefit. Um, these administrative bodies are comprised of scientists who are used to writing kind of a scientific protocol, but they are also comprised with non-scientists. So it's important that um, people without a scientific background can also understand the research um, and ensure that it's safe and meaningful um, for the potential subjects. Um, so those IRBs serve a really important function um, and we, we do a lot of interacting with them whenever we want to um, have any type of research done in an institution. Um, so I'm going to pause just before I kind of go into the different types of research that there are. Um, any questions as far as kind of, um, oh, I see a question. Who chooses the IRB members and who are the non-scientists? Okay, so who chooses the IRB? Um, it depends on the IRB. So sometimes IRBs will kind of put out a call to the community and say, uh, we have an institutional review board that's looking at research that's going to be conducted in our community. Are you interested in serving on this board? Um, sometimes it can be um, faculty, scientists and non-scientist faculty within the institution. Um, so you will see librarians, you will see um, uh, lawyers, you will see psychologists, you will see um, engineers um, that will sit on these IRBs. Uh, those are all considered non-scientists. Typically the scientists will be the MDs or a PhD in a scientific field. So a PhD in immunology or a PhD in chemistry or biology. Um, and the purpose of that is that as um, a sponsor, we need to make sure that we're writing a protocol um, that makes sense across specialties. So it needs to make scientific sense. It needs to meet a uh, scientific rigor. We need to have an endpoint that is statistically sound. Um, but we also need to um, have an ethical study that is uh, looking at how this is going to benefit um, the person who is participating in the research or how um, doing this research is going to end up, end up benefiting a person in the future. So um, we do sometimes do research on healthy volunteers um, and that is to just make sure that a device is safe. Um, and so it's not necessarily going to have a benefit on that person who's participating, but it will have a benefit on the greater population once this um, drug or device is approved. Um, okay, Patty, Joe, did that um, answer your question? Or any yes, other questions did. before I move on? Okay, Thank great. You. Yeah, and um, the other thing that is important is that um, the IRB members, all of that is public information. So um, we, um, as a sponsor, always collect the roster of who's sitting on IRB, and that is also something the public can do. Um, as a sponsor, we look to make sure that whoever our investigator is, that they are not also sitting on the IRB, or if they are sitting on the IRB, that they're recused from that board meeting, um, because that could be a conflict of interest. They're the investigator who's participating in this research or has written this protocol, therefore they can't be part of the IRB that determines whether it's um, a, a good protocol to um, use on volunteers. Okay, um, so moving on, I'm going to start with drug trials. So this makes up probably the majority of clinical research. Um, it's also very well defined. Um, so once we get into device research, which is what I do, um, it is continuing to be defined. <laughs> so devices are, are much newer to being tested. Um, there's a lot more medical devices um, than there used to be. So that's, it's kind of a developing field at this point. But 
um, for drug trials, they go through phase one all the way to phase four, um, unless it's an um, oncologic uh, medication, a drug used for cancer treatment, um, and they will sometimes have a phase zero. Um, so that's kind of unique to um, cancer medication, and the reason for that is that, um, as we know, cancer can be a very aggressive diagnosis, and so um, a lot of times they will um, test drugs earlier on people because um, the benefit continues to outweigh the, outweigh the risk, even if the, the drug has not been rigorously tested to show safety. Um, so we'll just go through kind of just a, an average drug. So we start with phase one. Um, this is typically done on 20 to 100 healthy volunteers. Um, like I said, for cancer trials or for certain other diseases, they can be done on people with the disease or condition. Uh, that's not typical. Um, so phase one, they usually start with a very small dose of the medication just to see how um, the patient's going to respond to it or the volunteer's going to respond to it, make sure that there's not a really large um, reaction, um, a, a bad reaction. Um, it's a pretty short study, so it's only a couple of months. Um, and really, the whole purpose of this study is to look at safety and also dosage. So sometimes there can be kind of a graduated dose of the drug, start out really small and kind of gradually increase to a higher concentration. Um, and approximately 70% of drugs moved on to phase two from phase one. So phase two is when we start getting into testing this medication on people who have the disease or condition um, that this drug is supposed to treat. Um, this phase two study can be several months to two years. Um, the reason for that is that we're um, looking to, to make sure that this drug is safe. Um, and also that it works. So the purpose of this study is efficacy and side effects. Um, and so that's the reason for a two-year follow-up. So a lot of times, you know, you'll start out with the, the subject is on the medication, and then um, they're on the medication for, let's say, 90 days. They go off of the medication, but they're continued to mo be monitored for up to two years. And that's to look and see if the drug actually works on the condition that it was supposed to treat, and also to monitor and see if um, there were a lot of side effects as a result of being on that medication. And this is where you see kind of a dramatic drop. So only 33% of drugs move on to phase three trials. Um, phase three trials are much longer. So you're looking at um, 300 to 3,000 volunteers um, with the disease or condition that the medication is treating. Um, and these trials go on for one to four years. So they're uh, much longer. They're looking um, at adverse events for much longer. And they're also looking to make sure that the drug works over a long term. So they're looking at efficacy and monitoring of adverse reactions. Um, only about 25% to 30 move on to phase four. Um, a lot of drugs can go ahead and be approved and marketed after phase three trials because you've shown that um, they are working and the um, reactions that might be seen are minimal. Um, and so phase four a lot of times can be considered kind of a post-market trial. So they're already on the market and now we're um, monitoring thousands of people to see how um, well does this drug continue to work in a general population and is it safe? So they're continuing to um, uh, organ tissue or um, other types of um, tissue, typically from animals, to test whether or not a device is safe. Um, we then move into a feasibility study. Um, this is done on a very small group of patients. Um, it's not usually driven by statistics. It's really just to um, see if this device is safe and kind of begin building some safety data um, for our next trial, which is a pivotal trial. Um, and so the pivotal trial is really where um, we have typically gone to the FDA with some um, information from our visibility trial, showing them that the device is safe um, and that the benefit is outweighing the risk associated with the device. 
Um, it's often used as our primary clinical support for a marketing application. Um, so for devices, they are all very um, tightly indicated for either a specific disease or a specific patient population. Um, and so this pivotal trial is collecting data to be able to show um, that it is safe and effective for that indication that we want to be able to market it for. Um, and then the pivotal, it is, the review is much more complex, takes a lot longer with the FDA, um, and also our sample size and our endpoints are always statistically driven. So we're, we, we have to show that we studied this on enough people um, and that we were able to achieve our endpoint in showing that this device is safe and worked in a way that we said it was going to work. Um, and then post-market, so we can do post-market studies where we're really just using this device and collecting adverse events in a traditional clinical trial. Um, but then we also have what's called post-market vigilance where we're always checking to make sure our device is continuing to be safe in the population. And we collect um, events throughout the life of a device. Okay, so I wanted to talk um, a little bit and I hope that there will be some questions about clinical research in older adults. So um, as I mentioned, often um, research is very narrowly focused. So um, we want to enroll healthy people. We want to enroll people between the ages of 18 and 64 for those reasons who don't have a lot of medical conditions, whose lab results look um, very healthy. Um, but the result of that means that we are not testing in a population that reflects what our actual um, general population is. Um, and so there have been a lot of efforts made recently um, to ensure that we're conducting clinical research in a population that represents our general population. And that means that we need to be doing research in older adults. Um, and so uh, what has happened is um, looking at um, requiring research to be done in the population that you want to use this device or drug in. So older adult population are suffering the greatest health burden in the Western world, and yet we're releasing drugs and devices that have not been tested on that population. As a result, we can see a lot more complications. Um, older adults a lot of times respond to medications very differently um, than younger adults who respond to me medication due to um, metabolic changes um, as we age. And um, therefore, we can see a lot more complications that may not have been identified earlier by not doing research on that population. Hey, Stephanie, it um, looks like Susan so, had a question. Sorry. Susan had oh, a question. Oh, sorry. Susan? Oh, um, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. It was a sort of delayed no. question. About, you know how there's always in, um, there's always a, a side effects. There'll be this long list of side effects yeah. uh, with any drug or in any kind of procedure. How mm -hmm. do they figure out how that gets on the list? Is there a percentage of, of cases? Yeah. Those adverse events come in um, and they all get categorized. So there is a, a coding system called the MEDRA coding system. And basically it takes every type of adverse event and it categorizes it into a body system and into a diagnosis. Um, large clinical trials also have a medical monitor and a lot of times a board of medical monitors. So these are physicians who are separate from the trial. Um, they're not conducting the research, so they're kind of outside observers and they review all of these adverse events and all of the coding and they look at percentage. So what percentage um, of these MEDRA um, pieces or um, events are there? And that's how they make it to that final list. So um, if they make it to that final list, it's because they were a higher percentage um, of people suffered those side effects. So there's not a specific percentage. And the reason for that is, um, uh, if there is, um, 
it, it, it's a lot of people are, or um, let's say that um, there were only a few adverse events reported, but they still were important. They want to be able to include those as a potential side effect. Um, so a lot of times we do set kind of risk thresholds of if more than 30% of the population in this research study report this adverse event, we're gonna be taking it to the medical board. Um, but the FDA then reviews every adverse event that was reported. And if they feel like an adverse event is important and maybe it didn't meet that percentage threshold, they could still require it to be listed as a side effect. Um, so that's part of the reason that they don't set a specific percentage um, for every adverse event that has to be listed as a contraindication or as a potential side effect. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. And I'm okay if we run over. So um, that's totally fine. Um, let's see. So Paula asked, what if there was a problem with a trial? What happens to those adversely affected? That is, does a volunteer sign documents that protect the organization from any potential liabilities? What rights, protections, and medical services are granted to volunteers when something goes wrong? And then who pays the medical monitors? That's a really, those are really, really good questions. So um, basically, if there is a problem with a trial, um, in the informed consent, we are required to list the adverse events that we are aware of. So in any um, animal testing that we've done, in any bench top testing that we've done, where it meets a certain risk threshold, then we have to include that in the informed consent as a possible risk. There are things that can happen in a clinical trial that we were never expecting. We never expected that to happen. Um, Sometimes that can be a good thing. For example, um, I mean, I guess this could be good, um, but <laughs> the pulmonary hypertension um, research was being done, and that is actually how Viagra was um, found. So Viagra is a medication for pulmonary hypertension. Uh, I actually had a friend who did this trial. It was done in pediatrics primarily because um, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension is um, a very serious condition and a lot of times people with it don't live into adulthood. So anyway, they were doing this um, trial on pediatric patients. They started to see this adverse event, um, these events happening, and all of a sudden they were like, oh, this medication actually could be used for this other thing. Um, so sometimes it can be a positive. However, um, a volunteer who agrees to do research does not sign away their rights. Um, and that is very important from a sponsor perspective and also from a hospital perspective and the institutional review board. So this is kind of why there are multiple reviewing boards to make sure that we're continuing to advocate for the rights of a volunteer. Um, typically when you sign up to do research, it's very clearly indicated what injuries would be covered by the sponsor of the research and what um, injuries would um, have to be billed to your insurance. So um, for example, I do a lot of healthy volunteer studies. Um, any injury that happens would be paid for by us because these are people that had no need to be um, undergoing any sort of medical treatment and therefore um, we need to pay for any injury that happens. For some people where we're following along a standard of care and potentially using a new device, um, we would ensure that they receive all treatment that could be related to that device and that is paid for by us. Um, and then we would also ensure that there was a way for them to continue to receive medical care. Um, our volunteers typically pay. Okay, um, and so, uh, we do make sure that volunteers are taken care of um, and that they are um, fully um, receive all of the medical attention that they need. Um, we also make it very clear that in, in an informed consent, um, this does not waive a person's right to um, receive medical care if they were to withdraw from the clinical trial. So let's say somebody starts being in a research study they decide they don't want to do it anymore. 
the doctor can't then be, you know, mad that they got out of the research and no longer um, take care of them. So, um, yes, so that is, that is typically how that works. Um, so as far as medical monitors work, um, medical monitors are typically paid for by the sponsor um, because it is a requirement that we have an unbiased um, opinion looking at our research. So I know that um, a lot of times, you know, we want to follow the money trail. And I think that that's, um, that can be a problem. Um, and so there have been safe, safeguards put into place where um, medical monitors sign agreements saying that, you know, they will not be um, negatively influenced by the sponsor, um, that they will continue to follow their medical judgment. Um, we sign, we agree to those documents that say that we will not influence the medical monitor, that they are being paid for their unbiased opinion. Um, all of this funding is also all accounted for. So we have um, new acts that have been passed, one specifically called the Sunshine Act. Um, it says that we cannot pay physicians more than a certain amount per year. And that those, the things that we are paying them for are clearly articulated in our agreements and contracts that we sign with them. Um, a lot of this came as a result of, you know, drug companies paying for extravagant vacations for physicians um, in exchange for kind of using their medication or um, positively promoting them. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot of um, work done, right, it, and I think in a very positive way to um, hold sponsors accountable for um, what we ask of our um, physician um, monitors and a physician um, consultants um, so that it's very clear what they're being paid for and how they can be influenced. Um, and the way that we interact with them is also very controlled. So um, no more, you know, dinners um, that are not, um, you know, very focused on a business objective. Um, so I think there are um, pieces that have been put into place to make this more regulated. Um, volunteers, um, we do typically compensate volunteers for their time. Um, so we're not necessarily paying them to participate in research. We're more compensating them for the time that they are taking out of their um, daily life to be a part of research. Um, we will also sometimes um, pay travel expenses for um, people to be able to participate in research. Um, I saw that a lot in doing pediatric trials. So um, Children's Hospital is a really a regional medical center and um, has specialists for diseases um, that don't exist elsewhere. And so we had a lot of kids that really needed treatment, needed to participate in research to have access to treatment. And um, we would pay for them to fly in from other states to be able to, I, we, I was at Children's at the time, but the sponsor paid for um, the, the children and their parents to be able to fly in, participate in research. So um, what's the typical pay? It really depends on how much time a study is gonna take. Um, and so uh, sometimes it can be as little as $25 if it's just kind of a questionnaire. Um, I, uh, sometimes it can be all the way up to um, a thousand or two thousand dollars if we're asking for a lot of time for subjects. Um, I have a study uh, right now that takes about six hours of a subject's time and so we're paying them, um, you know, between five hundred and a thousand dollars because that's a significant amount of time for them to participate in, this, in the trial. 